This is episode 66 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Today, I am very excited to share with you a conversation I had with Dr. Jake Thiessen, where we talked about the dark truths of a successful marriage. Dr. Thiessen believes that most relationship conflict rests on a foundation of dark truth. These are truths we believe to be so obvious no one would question them, and that it's the depth of belief and attachment to these beliefs that can cause so much heartache. Dr. Thiessen invites us to take a deeper look at these beliefs and to question them so that we can move closer towards the meaningful and deep relationships that our souls desire. Dr. Thiessen grew up in a small farming community in central Kansas. After graduating from college, he lived overseas for three years, one year in France and two years on an oasis in the Algerian Sahara, where he taught English as a second language. Experiencing the contrast between continents and cultures at a relatively early age began to teach him an appreciation for the differences that naturally occur between people. Dr. Thiessen earned his Master's in Theology and Marriage and Family Therapy from Fuller Theological Seminary. He also received his Doctorate in Marriage and Family Therapy from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. After completing his formal education, Dr. Thiessen taught full-time at the college level for 15 years while maintaining a private practice. His postdoctoral education includes certifications in conjugal relationship enhancement, couples communication, collaborative divorce coaching, divorce mediation, and focusing. In addition to training in existential gestalt therapy, he has also received ongoing training in couples therapy and couples sex therapy. Hi, Dr. Thiessen, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm very glad that you're here as well. I ran across your um, blog post about the dark truths of marriage, and it really was compelling, grabbed my attention because I feel like, you know, we all want these long-term committed relationships, Mm -hmm. and yet we are very uncomfortable with I think the discomfort and the actual work that's required to create these relationships. So thank you for writing that post. And, um, you know, maybe if we could start with you just sharing, how did you get started with your focus on couples? Well, you know, they did the whole graduate school thing and I was always interested in uh, marriages and that, that interest was initially sparked by a question my mother asked me when I was 15 uh, she asked me if she thought, if I thought she should stay with uh, my father, and you know, it was kind of an interesting question for me at 15. Of course, I suggested that she should, um, but that's what sparked my interest in couples. And uh, in addition to that, I spent a lot of time as a kid reading fiction, and to me, I learned a lot more about relationships and and fam- marriage and family that way than I would have, I think, reading nonfiction. And that's kind of how it got started, and it grew from there, of course. That's fascinating, especially, um, you know, that question that your that your mother posed to you. And then also, I think it's fascinating that you you found nonfiction more more helpful and instructive than the nonfiction. Oh, yeah. I mean, I in in college, I didn't major in psychology. I majored in English. And uh, so, you know, that was the, the literature has taught me a lot more about, I think, a lot more about relationships than reading you know, self-help books and that sort of thing would have. But Yeah. So I'm just going to, this wasn't a question I had planned on asking, but now I'm curious. <laughs> sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, can you share uh, maybe one or two books that you read that stood out for you as being a teacher about relationships? Oh, well, I'm, I'm more likely to share authors. Um, okay. <laughs> we'll do authors. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I love uh, Cormac McCarthy. I love Russell Banks. A, a book that stands out right now in my mind is a, a book called The, the Sweet Hereafter. 
uh, by Russell Banks. And, you know, there's, uh, there's others, of course, but those are the ones that jump out right now that kind of look at the depth of relationships and what happens in them. Pat Conroy is another one, uh, Prince of Tides and the Great Santini. Those are all novels that have taught me a lot. Thanks for sharing that. I'll make sure, sure. that those go into our show notes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Your blog post was The Dark Truths of Successful Marriage. Mm -hmm. Why did you write this? Mostly I wrote, it, I wrote it because, I mean, I've been working with couples for over 35 years, and, you know, people come in regularly, and usually one of the first things they say is that we don't communicate very well. And although I understand that, it, to me it seems like a very sort of shallow way of approaching the whole thing. It's as if, you know, by learning a few words or learning a, a particular technique of talking to each other, somehow things would be all better. I mean, I spend time talking with couples, asking them, you know, about their communication, for example, and I ask them, for example, if uh, when one of them is angry, does the other not notice that they're angry? And of course, they usually do. And so I point out that, you know, you are communicating pretty well. It's just that you're saying things that the other doesn't want to hear and that sort of thing. So, you know, my goal has been to kind of to get to the deeper things that are going on than, rather than stay at this sort of shallow level that, well, it seems to me like it's a, it's a fairly shallow level. Well, that makes a lot of sense as to perhaps why mm -hmm. when couples therapists focus on more of the skills, you know, communication mm -hmm. skills, conflict management, um, right. all of those things, why perhaps that can be experienced as, as a temporary or superficial or Band-Aid fix where they're good for maybe three, six months, and then it seems like they're back to where they were at the beginning. Yeah, that's been my experience. And, and sometimes it's even like you just are training people how to say bad things better. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, so it's, it, and, and, and the, the, the things that they have to say are often so repetitious. You know, they're going over the same things over and over and over again. And, and <laughs> rather than kind of getting into something that's a little deeper. Yeah. You know, one of my mentors, Dr. James Hollis, he's a union analyst. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He once said, and this is just, a, I'm taking this out of context because there was a lot around this phrase, but he said, many times people will go to couples therapy to avoid true intimacy. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that. I can imagine that without too much difficulty. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. So you had some amazing quotes throughout your website, and um, I, I just... I have to ask you about these quotes and why you chose them because I'm, you know, obviously they're meaningful to you in your work with couples. And so the first one by Nietzsche, mm -hmm. one should never know too precisely whom one has married. And I thought, wow, you know, that quote probably makes a lot of people uncomfortable because there's this idea that, you know, your partner so well. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that struck me, that, uh, that quote in particular struck me because um, it's gotten, it's become really clear to me that uh, when a couple knows something, they, they've really come to the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like when one says to the other, I knew you were going to say that, or I know what you're thinking, uh, you really have, there's really no point in going forward. So I mean, the, the, the approach that I take is to say that, well, we never really know we're always knowing, right. we're always in the process of getting to know, but we never really know, because if we know, then it's over. Yeah. It's, um, and I know you've mentioned this, I, I saw this on your website, that speaks to the mystery of the other, the mystery of this person in, in this relationship. Right, 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 right. I mean, to me, the, one of the core features of a well-functioning couple or a couple that is able to, you know, engage in each other intimately, at least periodically, is uh, an ongoing sense of curiosity, a willingness or a desire to kind of know the next thing, uh, as opposed to spending time on, you know, what was and assuming that what was is always what's going to, what's going to be. Mm. And also, um, you know, when you, you know, when you come from a place of I know, it forecloses on any possibility of growth or change. And so you can see how that just, I mean, to me, that naturally can lead to stagnation. Oh, or, exactly. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's, yes, absolutely. And then 
I, I believe this is your quote. I, I may have not found the, the mm-hmm. person who's, who said this on your website, but I think it's you. You uh-huh. said that it's easy to find the generally accepted features of a successful marriage. It's much harder to uncover the deeper, sometimes darker features of successful marriage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my take on things. I mean, the, the easy things are um, things like communication. Uh, do we, you know, do we both like the same things? You know, are we reading the same kinds of books or enjoying the same kinds of movies and all those kinds of things? Um, and it's even easy around, the, initially easy around the whole question of trust, for example. Like when I, I'll ask a couple, uh, you, do you trust each other? And often, I mean, depending on the circumstances, of course, but often they will say yes. Uh, and what they're referring to is they trust each other to not be sexually unfaithful. But in fact, trust is much more nuanced and much more complex than just, you know, what a couple does around sexual intimacy. Now, do I trust you with my emotions? Do I trust you to to hold them gently and to appreciate them? Do I trust you to show up at about the time that you say you're going to show up? Those kinds of things that happen, you know, all kinds of times during the course of a normal day. That's a really good example of um, the generally successful features um, as far as, you know, like you said, this trust. Can I trust you to be sexually faithful to me? Right. But then there's so many other levels. And I think those other questions are actually, you know, much harder to, to approach and to sit with. Oh, yeah. I mean, even I mean, when I'm working with a couple where infidelity has been an issue, and of course, that's uh, often what brings couples into therapy, the person who has been unfaithful, I will ask that person, do you trust your partner? And they'll often say, well, of course. But then we, the more you get into it, the more you kind of realize that the infidelity that they've engaged in is often the product of years of not having trusted their partner. So it's wow. a really nuanced kind of thing. And then, then, then you get this kind of who is really the victim here and for how long has it been going on and exactly what's been going on, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then finally, you had another quote. Um, I'm, again, I'm not sure who, whose quote this is. <laughs> you don't love because you love despite. Not for the virtues, but despite the faults. Yeah, I think that was William Faulkner. Yeah, th- that, that notion, and uh, there's another quote on there um, taken from Leonard, the Leonard Cohen uh, line, which is, everything has a crack in it. That's how the light gets in. Hmm. So that, I that love notion, that. Yeah, that, that notion that it's really in the imperfections that we find each other much more clearly than in the perfections. It's not really, you know, being with somebody who's really exactly what you want them to be is nice, of course, but it doesn't really give much texture. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, I'm just thinking too, you know, I think many, many of us have that, you know, that fantasy of the ideal relationship. And I, I, you know, it took some time for me to learn this too, but (laughs) I did. You know, you get to the place where, um, you know, all the projections fall away and now you're actually interacting with a real person. Um, And that, and I, this is something I share with, you know, my clients is, you know, now you're at the place where you can actually have a real relationship. I mean, you're really relating Mm -hmm. to each other now. This is Mm -hmm. the real deal. Before, when it was the honeymoon phase and you're having great sex and traveling and <laughs> romantic dinners, you know, yeah. you weren't in an actual real relationship yet. Right. At exactly. least not deep relationship. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, often I'll spend time with a couple, particularly where there's been infidelity, and subsequent to the infidelity, their conversations are so much deeper than they were prior to that. And, the, you know, the... Uh, the time that they spend with each other is so much more intense and present than it was prior to that. that I, you know, I feel compelled to say, you know, you guys are much more intimate now than you were, you know, six months ago or a year ago. This may be the, the most married you have been uh, than you've been for, you know, some time. Yeah. So you have identified, I believe, is it five dark truths? Am I getting... Well, I mean, I've identified a series of them. Okay. I don't know if I've plumbed all of them. There may be a few. Um, 
I wasn't sure. I just knew that there were several. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still working on the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remember, we don't want to know that there's right. five dark exactly. truths. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We, don't, we don't want to have a list of you know these five things and now you've got it. <laughs> got it. Yes. <laughs> so I think I'd like to go ahead and segue into some of these truths. And uh-huh. um, I just invite you to share, you know, maybe – you know, the, the ones that you feel are most significant, especially initially when a couple is struggling or when they, they come to therapy. Okay. And I don't know that the ones that I'm going to talk about are the ones that actually show up on my website, but they're the ones that come to mind right now. But, uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the one that comes up that, that jumps out at me probably most obviously is the, the notion that all relationships, all intimate relationships are sort of rooted in paradox, the notion that we are separate and related in the same space and time. That if we give up our, what a lot of people will do is they will give up their separateness in order to be related, or they'll give up their relatedness in order to be separate. And when you give up one or the other of those things, you're really losing the depth and breadth of what's possible. So you have to live in this tension of, I am separate and related all the time. And that's exactly where the real, you know, uh, growth in the relationship occurs. So that's the one that that jumps out first and foremost in my mind. So this is almost like it's speaking to that tension of opposites that Mm -hmm. that Jung spoke to and that it's in holding that tension where Mm -hmm. the, solution or what he would call the third would would emerge. Mm-hmm. Can you give an example for our listeners of what this could actually now look like in a relationship so that we can take the, the truth and have it as an example in a hypothetical couple? Well, um, you know, th- this one of the things that happens typically, and it happens a lot with men who think of themselves as good guys, is they will give up their own preferences in favor of their partner's preferences. You know, it's it's, it's as simple as, you know, where are we going to go out out to eat and what movie we're going to see and all that sort of thing. So what they're doing is they're giving up their separateness in order to be related. But the net result of that, of course, is that they don't really even exist. Mm, Uh, There's not really anybody to relate to because it's this, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing to bounce anything off of. That's, That's a really kind of superficial place where that occurs. Of course, it occurs much more deeply around, you know, issues related to parenting and all kinds of other things. Yeah. But that thing about, yes, I have this, I'm going to own my separateness, and I'm going to own my separateness in your company so that we can deal with it. Yeah. So maybe this can also show up, in, you, know, in, you know, in a relationship where one, you know, one or the other is avoiding conflict. And so just mm-hmm. kind of um, either backs down or doesn't bring things up anymore or it just goes along with what the other person is saying and, you know, doesn't really express exactly. how they're, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and I mean, for me, that, that kind of goes all the way then to, I mean, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but there's, there's a quality of infidelity in that. Like I'm mm. not showing up. Uh, I'm not really, you know, if you're looking for a dance partner, I'm not going to dance. So there's not this kind of mutuality that's possible in that kind of circumstance. So really the two people can, um, you know, for, for years or their entire marriage, not really ever dance or relate to each other. That's exactly right. I mean, I think of that kind of situation as a sort of a mutually agreed upon marital coma. <laughs> I've never <laughs> heard it described that way, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, people live their lives out that way, and okay. <laughs> yeah. So, what are some other truths okay. that, that stand out for you? Another thing that that comes for me is uh, that I believe that every couple that's been together for uh, any appreciable amount of time eventually gets to this place where they believe the other is going to be the death of them. That if I have to live my life the way this person wants me to, I might as well give up on everything I'd hoped for and vice versa. Like there's a, there's a quality of, of this thing is, is killing me. Mm. And that's why, you know, couples will often get into these places where 
arguments around really stupid topics become very intense uh, because it's really, I can't give in on this because my life, my, my integrity depends on not giving in. So it, beca- it has this kind of life and death struggle. So these, you know, the notion that a couple will take an argument and say, that was stupid. Why are we even arguing about that? And dismissing it as opposed to saying, no, I mean, the topic may have been stupid, but the argument is really, really contains all of the important stuff of the relationship and that needs to be looked at. Because it's not really about what they were arguing about. Right. It's not really about the topic. It's about how do I maintain myself in your company? How do I, you know, how do I actually exist, you know, with you fully and allow you to exist with me fully? You know, it's powerful. Like all these, you know, these, these two questions you just asked, you know, no one ever says those questions out loud, but you know, I, I can say, you know, from experience and from sitting with couples that this is something that's on their minds, whether they're aware of it or not, consciously right. or unconscious. That's, you yeah. know, and while they're in the heat of this argument, those questions of how do I exist within your company? How am I to be? How yeah. do I show up? And, you know, no wonder, you know, they have these epic battles. Right. Yeah. And how do I show up fully without, I mean, the other side of this is how do I show up fully without damaging you? you know, without, without, you know, how do I, you know, one of the things I say to couples also is that uh, if you can't inflict pain, you can't be in an intimate relationship. So how do I do this thing that's going to be painful in a respectful, compassionate, loving, patient way? Yeah. And I have so much, you know, perhaps intense energy behind whatever it is that's going on. Yeah, because there's a sense that um, I think this comes with being a good partner, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, good wife, good husband, of um, if, I, if I express what I need or I do what I want, mm-hmm. that hurts you. And so there's this sense, again, going back to how can I honor me um, mm-hmm. and still be with you? Mm-hmm. And how do I, how can I sit with hurting you? It's, it's right. a, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think you have to be, you have to get to a place where you're okay with the notion of hurting somebody, uh, but very clear that that needs to be done lovingly and respectfully uh, and that sort of thing. And I often sort of say to couples, but it's a little bit like your dentist, you know, if your dentist were, were afraid of hurting you, not much of anything would happen. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know who shared this with me recently. But recently, I spoke to someone who used the idea of immunizations kind mm-hmm. of similarly. And I know not everyone is, you know, I know there are all kinds of arguments about immunizations. Right. But yeah. she used the example as there was a time when, you know, parents would take their kids to get immunized before kindergarten. It was a whole bunch mm-hmm. of shots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, was a, oh, yeah. it was a very mm-hmm. difficult appointment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the parents knew that that their children, you know, the parents knew that this was what they had to do for their child to, to keep them safe, to keep them healthy, whatever their reasoning was. And so they, they allowed their child to be in that pain. They allowed the doctor or nurse to subject them to a series of shots, you know, but, and, and did this as lovingly as they could. And then was there Mm -hmm. to support them after and to console them. And that kind of really stood in my mind also when she was Mm -hmm. describing this, that this is really something that shows up in so many other ways. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yep. Another dark truth uh, for me is the, the distinction between uh, the truth and the whole truth. You know, couples often, because of how intensely they're trying to you know, protect themselves and make their point and all that sort of thing, they will land on a truth and then act as if that truth is the whole truth. As opposed to you know recognizing that yes okay it's a truth I mean then they they'll often sort of argue back and forth about whether this thing is really true rather than saying yes indeed that thing is true but it's not the whole truth yeah and the whole truth includes all kinds of other things which some of which may even contradict this thing that we've you know decided is a truth so the willingness mm. to go into those kind of conversations and and let go of the notion that this thing that I know is true, but it, let go of the notion that this is not the whole truth. It seems to me like it's really important in moving forward. So could this be, for, just for an example for our listeners of how this could show up, let's go back to infidelity. Mm-hmm. So maybe a truth that they can both agree on is one person was unfaithful. Mm-hmm. Right. 
but you can't just say period. <laughs> right. right. And, and, yeah, because it doesn't, it doesn't really go anywhere in that case that, you know, one person is unfaithful. Yes, that's true. But there's all kinds of other truths that, you know, that are also a part of the, you know, the relationship. The other truth may be that they've spent years not really paying attention to each other. The, the other truth may be that although, you know, he may have had an, uh, a, you know, an, an unfaithful re- relationship with, with another woman, she may have put most of her emotional energies into something else over the course of the relationship. So, yeah, there's multiple truths going on, and those need to be recognized if they're going to move forward. Yeah. The, the thing I want to get at is that it's so difficult for some people to let go of a truth that they've landed on because it so thoroughly defines how they want to move forward. That letting go of that truth then creates a a space where it's really unclear about how to move forward. And it becomes then for them a little bit dangerous because this truth that they've landed on is actually the thing that they're using to protect themselves. And if they give that up, they have less protection. They're more vulnerable. Yeah. And I think that's also where you see these, you know, these huge battles Mm -hmm. (laughs) that happen when each of them has landed on a truth that they're holding onto so tightly. Right. You know? right. Yeah, and then this is interesting because it can show up in, in such small, small ways. I, I see this a lot when it comes to things like, that's something I won't tolerate. I won't stand for that. If that happens, we're done. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> usually there's a... <laughs> To me, uh-huh. I, I see that as a, okay, so there's, again, like, like you said, you, you feel like this is it. You, you know this. You know, there's, mm-hmm. no, there's no room for discussion. There's no room for exploration. There's no room for ambiguity. And there's no room for other truths. Right, right. And, and, and I mean, at that spot, that particular spot that you've just described, what's interesting to me is that forward movement really seems to me to require the ability to submit. Mm. The ability to let go of my certainty, uh, to let go of my particular way that I've, you know, protecting, I'm protecting myself. And that means I have to submit to the possibility, to other possibilities for how we define current situation. Yeah, that's really powerful. And really, it's um, exploring why you have, um, I guess, created these defenses and entrenched yourself in a way that, you know, you are very defended against any other possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've, I've really come to be a little bit attracted to the, uh, to the notion of submission. I mean, in the seventies and eighties when I was going through graduate school, you know, it was, it was almost a, a word you did, you dare not utter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it was, it was so almost offensive to, to suggest that. But then, you know, if, if you don't know the right time and place to submit, you're really stuck in, the, in a, you know, in, in a, uh, a real, you know, dead end, a real, um, you know, there's no place to go without that in a lot of, uh, in a, on a lot of occasions. And I think, too, that, you know, if, if there's no place for submission, then everyone is trying to dominate. Exactly. What ends, up, ends up happening. Right. And right. I think that, you know, submission, you know, that I equate that like with that vulnerability uh-huh. um, and the not knowing, the uh-huh. ambiguity. And these are all uncomfortable places, you know? Yeah, exactly. We you know, all the wanna, willingness to step into an unknown spot is yeah. vital. Yeah. And, and the reality is, um, you know, we are pretty much – in ambiguity all the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, this is clearly a nuanced and complex area, you know, when we're starting to look at these truths mm-hmm. of human experience. Because I, I think it's not just in relationship, but these are truths for the individual as well. How would you suggest to someone that they begin to get into a relationship with these truths in a more conscious way? For me, you know, what stood out is curiosity. That's always, I feel like, a, a good place to be in order to begin to, I guess, to navigate these uncharted, uncomfortable waters. Right. I, mean, I think it's, it, it, the, the thing to pay attention to is how you are in your body when you approach a particular topic or a particular situation. So, you know, if there's something in you that is, that's saying, uh, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, this may not be safe, that you are 
perhaps, and I think you need to pay attention to, to that spot, you are perhaps right at the point where this a darker thing may be approaching and uh, curiosity would be the thing to engage it as a way of moving through that whole thing. So, you know, if I'm feeling like, oh, I don't want to say that to my partner, I, I don't want to really go there, then that's probably a place I ought to entertain actually going uh, mm. with as much, you know, caution and respect and patience as I can muster. But it is probably the place I ought to think about going. That's powerful. So it's really uh, noticing when you have these um, responses, you know, in your body Mm -hmm. and um, almost doing the opposite. You know, if you're feeling like you want to withdraw, retreat, shut down, allowing yourself to be uncomfortable and to, you know, to to say what is difficult to say, to to show up, to be Mm -hmm. there. Right, right, right. I mean, it's... It, it's that spot, I mean, I, I, that to me, is really the, the, the place to, to get to. When I work with couples, that's when I notice that we're at that spot, I'll try to help them, you know, pay attention to exactly what's going on right then and what the next step might, might be like and, you know, what are they trying to avoid and all those kinds of things. So powerful. It's just mm-hmm. really, you know, I, I love viewing these um, – uncomfortable spaces as invitations to deeper connection to true intimacy it's mm-hmm. it's instead of backing away from it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and the other twist on this for me and i don't know if this is exactly where you want to go with this but the other twist on this for me is that uh, you know couples i think and maybe all of us in life in general but mm-hmm. couples just kind of go around in circles <laughs> over. um and 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 what I try to communicate is that, I mean, there's the kind of circle that a top goes in and it doesn't really go anywhere. It just spins. And then there's the kind of circle that a screw goes in and every time it goes around, it's in a slightly different place. So, so, so this notion that I, I want to resist this because it feels so familiar to me is not a legitimate notion. I, I should enter this even though it feels familiar because it will come around if I stay with it in a slightly different place than it did the last time I went through this. I love how you describe that. I'm going to be using that (laughs) in my work. That's beautiful. No, that's really beautiful because that, you know, there is that sense of I've been here before. It's an uncomfortable, uncomfortable place. I don't want to do this again. You know, but yeah. yeah, Right. And that to me is, yeah, that's exactly one of the reasons why we step back is because oh, I've done this before, but actually you haven't done this exactly the same way. It's a slightly different spot. And so this connects back again to what you said at the beginning of our conversation with not coming from a place of certainty in that I know this. Like, because oh, when yeah. you say, I've been here before, I know what this is, you mm-hmm. foreclose on any growth or possibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a line at the end of uh, advertisements about stock uh, uh, stock markets, about buying stocks and that sort of thing. And the line goes something like, uh, past performance does not predict future results. <laughs> so, I, I love that line. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Oh, my goodness. I'm thinking of the opposite line that I'm sure you've heard, that the best predictor of future Ex- behavior is past behavior. <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, Jake, for our listeners who, um, you know, maybe this is, you know, they've, they've landed on today's episode. This is, mm-hmm. you know, maybe piquing their interest and they are interested in learning more about these truths or uh, this way of being. What kind of resources do you recommend if, or websites or books for, for those who maybe would like to delve into the, some of the topics we've been talking about today? Well, I mean, my, my website is uh, www.com couples at crossroads.com. So there's that. Um, the books that are, that are there are uh, kind of difficult to come by, I think, relative to all this stuff. Um, I would recommend some of the Jungian uh, books that are fairly old, actually, to, to read. And I'm just blanking on the author right now. <laughs> Robert Johnson, is that right? Yeah, that? Robert Johnson, yes. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I'd, I'd recommend him. I mean, I like uh, the, the, the other books like Women Who Run With the Wolves, those kinds of things that kind of help us yeah. look at these things more 
you know, in, in a different way than, than uh, you know, the typical blog where you're saying, well, here's five steps to X or 10 right. steps to Y and that sort of thing. Yeah. Clarissa Pinkola is teased for our listeners. Um, she writes, she uses metaphor and stories mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. folklore and myths to, mm-hmm. um, to elucidate a lot of the concepts we've been talking about, the internal processes that are happening within us as mm-hmm. individuals and certainly in relationship. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So in your work, you've been doing this for a long time, you know, mm-hmm. what, what has um, surprised you the most in this work or maybe what, how does this work inspire you? Well, I know that's surprised, but in, in a way it does surprise me, but uh, is that every couple I think is really pretty evenly matched. One isn't, you know, more dysfunctional than the other. It's rare that one is more, you know, morally upright than the other. They all have, it's all pretty evenly matched. And if you pay attention to it, uh, and if you help them pay attention to it, they can see those the, the evenness of it and that and the possibility of intimacy that comes with respecting that sort of that evenness that that's probably the thing that I think is is most clear to me I mean because most couples come in uh, you know with one feeling like the bad guy and the other feeling like the good guy but that's really not what's going on at least in my mind and so when they're able to shift into one of us isn't bad, one of us isn't good. We're just, we're here and we're both good and bad and everything in between. Again, that opens up the door for deeper connection and intimacy. It does. And like you said, I think, uh, you know, a few minutes ago that uh, you quoted uh, the person who said that, you know, couples who want to avoid intimacy go into couples counseling. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, they, they, they go in often to validate their rightness uh, and, <laughs> and thereby, you know, avoid any intimacy. So suggesting that, you know, the rightness that they're re- taking refuge in, refuge in isn't uh, all that, you know, singularly right really makes them think uh, about, makes them, pushes them into an intimate place, which often they don't really want to, they don't really don't want to go there. You know, Jake, thank you so much for, you know, this just wonderful conversation that we have had today. I am really grateful that you are doing the work you do for couples. I I know that it's not, your approach is not common Mm -hmm. (laughs) and your way of thinking, your way of viewing relationships, um, you know, just really has a richness. And I feel, um, you know, definitely that transformative healing approach that needs to be there for meaningful change and and you know again i know not all couples therapists work the way that you do so just grateful that you're here to do this work thank you thank you um if there are listeners who'd like to get in touch with you or learn more about your work or any workshops or services that you're offering um what's the best way to find out about these things uh again just go to the website couples at crossroads, uh, dot com. that's you know, I try to stay up, stay on top of that fairly with some, you know, regularity. Um, that's where I post workshops and I'm doing uh, private retreats with couples um, around this whole topic. And that's where you'd find out about it. Okay. Thank you so much again for your time today. And I am really looking forward to sharing our conversation with the world. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Thiessen. I found his insights so compelling and so enriching and so meaningful for our relationship with ourselves and our relationships with others. I appreciated his insights on the nuances of infidelity and the significance of truth in relationships and what is the whole truth and how to let go of a truth and what happens when we don't let go. I also loved his insights on the concept of submission in relationship, something that is uncomfortable for, I would say, most of us or all of us, um, and yet it is an integral part of relating. I also loved how he shared that curiosity can go a long way in navigating relationships and to leading us to deeper connection. Finally, I appreciated 
his suggestion of paying attention to how you are in your body and that these bodily or somatic intuitive instinctive reactions are signposts for you to pay attention to take notice and to to dig a little deeper to become curious for show notes to today's episode and links to all the resources that are mentioned please visit www.lordesviado.com forward slash women in depth and if you enjoyed today's episode please subscribe on itunes or share with a friend Thank you so much for listening and see you next time.